Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what I think the key issues are for 2019 and compare it to where we were in 2018. Now, you might remember, obviously, we had in 2016, 2017, we had two great years. Market did very well. We all went into 2018 feeling very positive. If I'd been standing in front of you at the beginning of 2018, I'd have said, look, um, there isn't going to be a trade war. Uh, US dollar is going to continue to come down. Emerging markets are going to outperform uh, developed markets. Corporate earnings are going to be strong, and valuations look reasonable. And I was completely wrong on all of them, all of them. The only thing that I said to our clients that made any sense at all is, you should expect a lot of volatility, which is normal in my world. So that was it. So of course, coming into 2019, end of 2018, 2019, everybody is, is of course terribly pessimistic. Trade deal isn't going to get done. Dollar's going to keep going up. The US economy is outperforming. US equities are outperforming. Everything looks doom and gloom. Everything's terrible. Uh, in the emerging world. And actually, what's happened at the beginning of the year? Emerging markets have outperformed. Why has that happened? Now, it's happened, A, I think, because, partly because the market, and specifically the Chinese market, agrees with you that the deal is going to get done. What's the best performing market um, in the emerging world? China A shares, up. 25% uh, year-to-date, and we've got some stocks that are up 70, 80% year-to-date. Um, the US dollar, um, those of you that have, have listened to me speak before know that I talk endlessly about the importance of the US dollar. Why does the US dollar matter? Because when the dollar is going up, that is very bad news for emerging markets. Why? Because it's going up either because people like the US, which isn't great for me, or it's going up because people are scared, which again, isn't great for me. So a falling US dollar is a really good place for us to be, and I think there is some reason to think that the dollar has at least plateaued. What are the other key things that we need to think about? We talk about this um, slightly weird concept of an emerging market growth alpha. What, is, what am I talking about? What I'm trying to say is, do the emerging market economies grow faster or slower than developed markets. In a world when they grow more slowly, which is what happened last year, that's bad news. In a world when they grow faster, you typically see emerging markets outperform. And they out why does that happen? And that leads us on to the next key thing that we need to think about, corporate earnings. Typically, emerging markets need more rapid economic growth than developed markets do uh, in order to drive earnings growth. Why is that? Because companies in the US and in Europe often buy back stock so they can drive earnings growth without much revenue growth. In my world, we have to have revenue growth in order to drive corporate profits. So that is something we're also think thinking is turning in a more positive set. And the final thing to think about is valuation. Many of you have heard me talk, I know, in the past about price to book, which we think is the single most important um, element. And at the beginning of the year, we were at about 1.5 times price to book, which is slightly attractive, not hugely attractive. But a signal that I think is actually more important is our own internal research signal. So we think in terms of long-term expected returns. So obviously, when share prices are high, expected returns will be low. And when share prices are low, expected returns should be high. So you should see this pattern going up and down. The end of 2017, expected returns had come down to about 8%. So historically on the low end. By the time we roll forward to the end of 2018, those expected returns had gone up to 17. Not quite the highest they've ever been, but not very far away. And surprise, surprise, markets have started to rally. So now we've seen that expected return number come from about 17 to currently down around 14. So we're, we're now trending back towards 
roughly speaking, average levels. So what's really important for me going forward is do emerging market companies deliver on the earnings that we're expecting them to? And if they do, is that going to be enough to keep the bull market moving forward? There's lots of talk both on Europe and emerging market reg regarding earnings. Not surprised that you haven't really touched on politics because uh, democracy surprisingly doesn't cause any issues in terms of the large economies that you cover, such as Russia and China. Um, but how are the equity <laughs> markets holding up? What are, the, what are the risks that you see in the equity markets? Okay, so the key risk in my world is always this chart, which many of you have seen before. It's all about volatility. Um, no one should invest in the emerging market or Asian asset class if you want to have uh, an easy ride. Uh, I have an interesting statistic which I was uh, quoted earlier on. If I said to you which asset class, which equity market has performed best in the last 25 years, so from 1995 up to 2019, Russia or the US? Which do you think it would be? Maybe put your hands up. Who, th who thinks the US did better than Russia over the last 25 years? Virtually all of you. Who thinks Russia did better? Oh, well, maybe we're split 50-50. Okay, so in US dollar terms, the Russian equity market from 1995 to today has given you a return of 15% annualized. The US equity market over that period has given you a return of 9% annualized. But twice in that period, twice, 1997 and 2008, you had lost 90% of your money in Russian equities. So the reality is we'd all love to hold on, but most people could not stomach losing 90% of their money. So volatility is the key issue. Which is why we always say to our clients, particularly those of you who've been long-term investors in our trust, you need to stay fully invested. If you hold um, emerging markets, and this is the index, and the trust has done better than this, um, over this period, you've made 10.6% in sterling. If you'd missed the best 50 days of the market, you'd actually lost money over this period. So my key message is always, be patient. So, thank you, Richard. Um, an earnings growth story there. Uh, we're not saying pull your money in Russian equities, uh, just to make that entirely clear. Um, uh, but in Europe, we've got Brexit. We've got Italy with their recent debt troubles. Uh, and Europe kind of stuck in the middle of the China-US little tiff about trade that we're seeing at the moment. Tom, what are the risks to European equities at the moment that you see? Well, I think you've touched on the main one. It's, it's politics. And this is an ongoing theme for us as, as European investors. You can't deny that from a political perspective, Europe is a very complex place. 28 member states of the EU, different governments. Governments have different initiatives, different incentives, different targets that they want to achieve. And for that reason, at most points in time, there is something going on from a political perspective that causes investors to be concerned. So Andy's just touched on a few that we have today. We have plenty. Uh, we have the US-China trade wars outside of Europe, but very much impacting companies within Europe. We have the yellow vest protests in France. We have snap Spanish elections. We have Italian debt. We have Brexit. Um, you can almost go on and on and on and on. Let's go back two years. The, the flavor of the day two years ago was populism. We had, in the first half of 2017, Dutch elections where people were concerned that the Freedom Party led by Gert Wilders were going to come into power in the Netherlands. We had the French elections where Marine Le Pen and the National Front were leading the polls for a period of time, which again caused concern that we were going to get populist parties ruling in France. And the concern that then led from that was that perhaps the EU might not be as solid as it has been historically. Go back prior to that, we had the sovereign debt crisis, 2011, 2012. Greek bond yields at 30%, concern that Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Spain 
were all going to go the same way and that we had a number of insolvent economies within Europe. So this begs the question, and it's an interesting question given the responses that, that you guys um, put forward when Andy asked the initial question about who was positive on, on Europe. Is there ever a good time to invest in Europe? And we think the answer is a resounding yes, and I'll tell you why. The reason why is that what history has shown us is that the market is very, very bad at pricing political risk. So let's think about a couple of examples. Let's go back again to the sovereign debt crisis. As I said, Greek bond yields at 30%, Greek banks being bailed out. Big concerns in the market that actually this was going to lead to contagion into the other peripheral economies, uh, affectionately known as the pigs, Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Greece itself, and, and Spain. But lo and behold, you, you do a bit of work, you do a bit of analysis, and actually it becomes apparent that the debt situation, whilst still not fully resolved, to be fair, is not as bad in some of these other economies. And you saw a spike in bond yields, but a fairly quick reversion back to a normalized level to where we are today. Had you invested in Italy, as an example, at the height of that sovereign debt concern and held that investment through to today, you can see on the, on the left-hand side, you would have achieved returns in excess of the broad European market. Brexit. Now, we've heard a bit about Brexit already. It's less relevant as a direct investment in this strategy, given we focus on Europe X UK, but it's very topical, and I think we should again touch on it as a good example of how the market can sometimes price these events um, very aggressively. So let's go back to June the 27th, 2016. The market was convinced that the UK people would vote to stay within the EU, and we all got a horrible shock when we woke up in the morning and found that actually this was not how things panned out. And we got into work and we waited for the market to open, and over the next two days, the UK market sold off 7%. You had companies like Redrow, which some of you may be familiar with, a UK house building company, which was off 70% on the morning of the Brexit result, 70%, 70. Was that the right price move for a company which undoubtedly would be impacted by Brexit? But was it now worth 30% of what it was worth the day before? We feel that when market participants start to talk about an Armageddon scenario and the fact that the UK had a lot worse to come and was potentially uninvestable on a forward-looking basis, was a massive overreaction. And I caveat that with the fact that we're still in an uncertain state today around Brexit. We still don't know what the outcome looks like. But had you been willing to invest in the UK market on that morning of the, the Brexit referendum result, you would have returned more through to today than you would have done had you invested in the broader European market. So again, another example of how some of these political risks can actually manifest themselves as opportunities from a valuation perspective. So basically, you want some bad news on the political front to make some, uh, make some money. OK, thank you, Tom. They're the risks that you perceive, but uh, I think the general view is there on both is, you know, stay in these markets for the long term. Um, it's very difficult to time these, these situations. Um, so let's continue with the theme of the risks. Uh, and again, we want to come over to you, uh, throw it over to the audience here. Uh, the UK. As I'm sure we'll, we all know, if you're not aware, we're, we're potentially leaving the EU. I'm sure you might have read that in the press. Um, the first country to do, do so since 1957. So a pretty mon monumentous event, uh, as, far as, I'm, and, and, as far as I'm concerned, and something we've never seen before. Uh, but the question we want to ask you is, now that the UK is leaving, and Tom's talked about the populist parties and how there was fear of contagion of perhaps other countries following, uh, what your view is? Uh, do you think the European Union as a project is doomed to failure? Now, some of you might not choose to answer this. Um, uh, we can't track who's got which keypad, by the way. We're not, we're not that clever. Uh, so, if you think that the European Union is a project doomed to failure, and you think it, think it is, please press A. If you think that it is not doomed to failure, press B. And if you think anything 
can happen in the world at the moment, press C. If you could make your votes now. People might be so uncomfortable with this vote, no one votes. We'll see. Well, that's reassuring for, for the world, isn't it? Um, so the majority of you, 60% of you, think that the European Union is, is not a project doomed to failure. And I think that stacks up with what you said about concerns over contagion. Perhaps they were unfounded. Um, interestingly, 12% of you think anything can happen in the world at the moment. I'm kind of in that 12% uh, about anything in the world at the moment. OK, so uh, that's the audience's view, which kind of, I hope, is your view as well, Tom, being a European equity investment manager. But uh, what are your views regarding the European Union? And what sort of companies are you identifying as attractive opportunities at the moment? Yeah, well, that <laughs> I think that result was... Uh more enjoyable than the first result, <laughs> should we say. Um, I mean, we, we agree. We think that the EU can continue to work. Um, and again, I would... <laughs> I, think, I think Brexit has taught people a lot about what leaving the EU actually involves and how easy it is to do and how potentially the headlines around getting out of the EU can be a lot more simplistic and a lot more palatable than the realities. And I'd go back to some of the recent elections that we've seen across Europe. So again, the examples of France and the Netherlands in, in 2017. Number one, let's remember that these populist parties with anti-EU agendas didn't get into power. I don't think realistically it was ever likely that they would. And again, I go back to sensationalist headlines which suggest opinion poll leads and um, uh, and, and the suggestion that that could translate itself into the results that we would end up seeing, in reality, some of the mechanisms around elections within Europe were likely to prevent these populist parties from ever really having a chance of winning. But the other thing I'd point to is some of the opinion polls that we saw, um, not just in France and the Netherlands, but also in the likes of Italy, Spain and other European countries, Germany as well, which went out to people on the street and said, do you want your country to leave the EU? And overwhelmingly, across Europe, people don't seem to have a desire to leave. And the clear outlier was the UK, and you could argue that where we are today, perhaps we're going to end up with a much softer Brexit than people initially anticipated. Perhaps we're not going to have any Brexit at all. Who knows? We're still very much in a state of flux and uncertainty. The beauty is that actually when investing in Europe, you don't necessarily need to have a strong positive view on Europe from an economic or a political viewpoint. And the reason I say that is that Europe is a very global investment region. About 50% of revenues come from within Europe, but about 50% come from external regions, the US, emerging markets, for example. So if we think about Total, a company that I'm sure many of you will be very familiar with, uh, a major oil company which is listed in France, but I think you'll all agree is very much global in terms of its footprint. Now again, go back to that French election in the first half of 2017, and many market participants and commentators would have said, Marine Le Pen and the National Front are leading in the polls, this is a disaster for France, it's a disaster for Europe, Europe and in particular France is not investable. Had you invested in Total at that point in time, fast forward to today, and despite some of the huge volatility that we've seen in the oil price market, you would have achieved excess returns of about 10% over the broad market. So a global company and a company that's able to deliver regardless of what's going on from a political or an economic perspective. Let's think about DeLonghi. DeLonghi is a small cap Italian company. Now, many of you may be familiar with it. Many of you may have their coffee machines in your homes because, believe it or not, it's not just uh, the Italians that rely on an espresso as a, as a morning pick-me-up. We've very much changed our habits over the last 20 years. You see numerous people walking into the office in the morning with a, with a cup of coffee in their hand. That didn't tend to be the case so much 20 years ago. But DeLonghi, whilst being an Italian-listed small-cap company, is again global in its footprint. It sells its coffee machines into 33 countries and every single continent on the globe. 
go back to that sovereign debt crisis. How many people were banging the table and saying, you need to buy Italian small cap companies today? Not many. How many were saying, you cannot touch Italian, Spanish, Irish, Portuguese, particularly small cap companies, because these economies are, are going bust? That was much more prevalent. Had you invested in the summer of 2012 in DeLonghi, you would have uh, achieved returns of 350% on your money through to today. 350% versus a broad market on about 100%. So again, if you're willing to do the work, carry out the analysis, understand the fundamentals of the businesses that you're investing in, some of these risks and concerns in the market can present real attractive opportunities. Thank you, Tom. So coffee can be good for you, not from a medical perspective, but maybe for your returns. <laughs> um, but very global names there. 